the mystery of Cabin Island. The Hardy Boys are elated over their good luck when wealthy Elroy Jefferson invites them to spend Christmas vacation at his private retreat on Cabin Island. But when Frank and Joe make a reconnaissance trip in their ice boat, the Seagull, to the island, a belligerent stranger orders them off. Why? Before 24 hours have passed, the Hardys find themselves involved in two mysteries. The first concerns the recent disappearance of Mr. Jefferson's grandson, Johnny. The second, the baffling theft of a priceless collection of antique medals, which took place two years ago. The young detectives, with their pals Chet Morton and Biff Hooper, those are their actual names, pursue both cases on the icebound, snow-covered island. Sabotage to the seagull, danger to themselves, and a ghostly prowler do not daunt Frank and Joe in their search for Johnny Jefferson and for clues to the stolen antique medals. How the teenage investigators outwit a ruthless foe and succeed in solving both mysteries makes for mounting suspense in this brisk-paced adventure. And from a good, good, good ghost. Yes. Good, good, good. Oh, they find out that the, the ghost sounds that were hearing in the house oh, yeah. is the classic like wind over the bottle top. Yeah. Because Jefferson used a, a bottle to plug a hole in his roof? Yeah. As you do. As you do. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if they were the first to do that. 1929. That sounds like a little rascal. Yeah, yeah it really Charlie does. Chaplin. Yeah. yeah. It's 2017, and everyone gets a podcast. Mine is the Hardy Boys Drink Book. Today, I'm joined by writer and raconteur R. Allen Brooks. Our cocktail was created by Ben Hoops at the Squire Lounge, and it'll knock you flat like a wreck on an ice boat. Enjoy the Hardy Boys Drink Book, number eight. The Mystery of Cabin Island. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. I am Charles Wefso, and I am here with R. Allen Brooks, writer, creator of Burning Metronome. You're the writer of the Burning Metronome. You're the host of Motherfucker in a Cake, one of my yeah. favorite podcasts. Thanks. So, uh, other than the things I just said, who is R. Allen Brooks? <laughs> That's a big question. Yeah. I've Define yourself in a few words. Uh, gamma irradiated intellect. I don't know. I don't know. I'm from Atlanta. Okay. I've been in uh, Denver for 13 years, though. Uh, I'm a musician. Rap with a jazz band. Cool. Twice a month at Ophelia's downtown. Sure. So I, I mentioned earlier, before we started recording, that I uh, talked with my landlord today. And uh, I was leaving with uh, it was a girl who was, <laughs> who was visiting me. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, get out of here for the landlord. You know, I, don't, I don't want you to do it. Because he yeah. always says obnoxious stuff. And so he saw her leave, and then he was like, you know, Alan, uh, I I know that we've been kind of laid back about the lease and everything, but it's not a condition of your lease that you have to have a different woman every time I see you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a very interesting lease. Right. I want to see what other things are in that lease. I was like, like, that's just a condition of being Alan. Nice. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, that's awesome. Uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Motherfucker in a Cape. Yeah. Would you just talk a little bit about the idea behind the behind the show? Yeah. Uh, so it is uh, me having conversations with marginalized people in the comic book and geek community. So when I was a kid, I would go to comic book conventions. I say this in the intro. Yeah. And it would be like me and white dudes in their 40s. That'd be it. Right? Like not even any other kids. And they didn't make... Comics weren't popular enough in Atlanta to have their own convention, so it would be like comic book slash Star Trek convention. Right. And they didn't make black Vulcan ears. I wanted to be a Vulcan. No Tuvok yet. Right. Right. So, like, uh, it's interesting to see how much it's grown, because it used to be like if I was tell people I was into comics, they'd be like, you still read comic books? Mm-hmm. And now it's like, oh, you read comic books? Like, everything's changed. Yeah. It has been really crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, seeing how it's all grown... Now it's big enough where um, I can talk to people who are kind of like in these uh, weird corners. Mm-hmm. You know? So I've interviewed like a sex worker who makes comics. I spoke with black women geeks, disabled geeks. We were talking about, I interviewed a woman in England who started a, a comic book convention that has a staff of 80% women, which I feel like is unheard of yeah, that's, anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's hard to believe. Yeah, so, you know... Just but that's great. I, I wish that that was something that wasn't so hard to believe. Right. Uh, yeah. I really liked the episode that you just did uh, on immigrant comic book oh, writers. Yeah. That one was really interesting. Yeah, it's a fascinating listen. <laughs> so everybody check that out. And I'm going to put a link, obviously, on the website. Oh, yeah. And my mother was not uh, super into the name. Like, when I named a motherfucker, oh. okay, she didn't, she didn't like that. But then she listened to a few, and she was like, oh, okay, this is cool. I like yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. 
All right, well, Alan, when was the last time that you read a Hardy Boys book? You know, uh, I was trying to think if I ever had read a Hardy Boys book. Some people haven't. Yeah, I mean, it's in the cultural zeitgeist, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm aware of it. And I, I think maybe when I was a kid, but I know that there was like that 70s TV show. Right, where they had like the feathered... Yeah. Hair. It's a little before my time, but I'm aware of, like, aware of it, you know? Yeah. But, like, uh, I might, yeah, so I don't know. Usually, even if people have, like, vivid memories that I read the Hardy Boys books, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be like, do you recognize this one? And they're like, I recognize the cover, but I have no memory of it. Huh. Because these books are fairly disposable. I've noticed that people ask me, what episode did you do? Like, what book did you just do? And I can't remember. Huh. A quick note about the Hardy Boys Mystery Series. The Hardy Boys Mystery Series was written by Franklin W. Dixon in the 1920s. Uh, Franklin W. Dixon is better known as the inventor of solar-powered flashlights. The books were heavily rewritten in the 1950s to make them more PC, huh. uh, less racist. I always say that if the 1950s thinks that you're too racist, you yeah. have a real serious problem. Right. And so, uh, yeah, so they edited The Boys Are More Respectful of Authority Now. Huh. Um, also, they have more money than oh. they used to. Wow. Uh, they changed a bunch of stuff, but this is a good one because I read the synopsis of both versions, and they're pretty much the same. Okay. Some of them are entirely different stories with the same name. Huh. Yeah. yeah. So anyway. Okay. Well, yeah, I was looking at the earliest one. It was 1929. And I was yeah. Like, huh. But I, was, I took note of, like, cultural, uh, like, subtleties, like, describing women by their marital status. Yes. Or, uh, or the fact that there are actually characters named Chet and Biff. Chet and Biff, yeah. yeah. Those are their real names. That was pretty funny to me. Um, oh, and then this cliche of the uh, overweight character who is a coward and constantly talks about food. Yeah, you know? that's his entire personality. Like in every... every Mama, maybe, there's right. ghosts. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder, you know, I mean, since it was written so early, I guess it, it may have started this trend, I don't know, but it seemed to hit all this sort of child mystery cliches, like... Clearly, uh, Scooby-Doo owes a lot to these books. Right? Oh, yeah. Because there was, like, the old man with the mysterious island. There was an obnoxious guy trying to buy the island. There was somebody missing, uh, someone rummaging through their stuff, and then the g -g 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 ghost thing, right? Yeah, there yeah. has to be a ghost, uh, which turned out to not be a ghost at all, but, yeah. then, but then they keep calling him Mr. Ghost. Right, we, yeah. Anyway, well, let's jump into the story. In the beginning, the boys, it starts with a reward, which I really like. Usually, mysteries end with a reward. This one starts with them saying, what a great reward, yeah. is the first line of the book, I think. I mean, it's not quite it. It's the best of times. It was the worst of times. But No. What a reward, <laughs> Joe Hardy exclaimed. Uh, yeah, but they, uh, in one of the previous books, they stopped to ring a car thieves. Apparently, Elroy Jefferson's car was stolen, and when they returned it, yeah. he was so grateful that he told them that they could spend Christmas break at his private cabin on an island yeah did you ever figure out how big that island was <laughs> no because it seems like it's this tiny little thing but people can like hide out there at one point they don't know how many people are on the island yeah geography is not a big a strong part of the, uh, <laughs> i was looking for the maps weird no maps <laughs> and we have said many times there's no way we could draw a map of bayport at this yeah. point it's there's no geography that makes any sense hmm. and the island is far enough away that they have to take uh, their ice boat. Yeah. They have never had an ice boat before. I want to make that clear. This is the first appearance That's of really the funny. seagull. Yeah. And they're like, they go to get it out of the boathouse and their regular speed boat, the sleuth, is suspended like up in huh. the air on a metal rack. Huh. And That's now they, funny. So now they've got motorcycles, an ice boat, a speed boat, and a car. And a car. Yeah. Well, it's funny because, you know, the bully characters came in, right? And they Also had their first nice appearance. Boat. Okay. Yeah. And it, but they, like, knew them, right? They, they like, knew them right away. Those guys are troublemakers, you know? Tad so, and Ike. Uh, yeah. Tad and Ike. So I was like, okay, these guys have been, you know, regular characters on their fucking ice boats. Or are they bleeping ice boats? I, <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to figure out later. But I was so relieved that the boys finally have rivals that aren't, like, dangerous criminals in their 60s yeah. and 40s Yo. and stuff. So I was like, okay... They're, they're dealing with this uh, criminal mm -hmm. who, who is sort of threatening Jefferson in order to get the island. Yeah. And their father is aware of it. Right. And their father a famous leave, detective. Right. And their father's leaving them notes like, hey, you know, just keep an eye on that guy. I know you're dealing with an adult who's a criminal, but you guys, you, you, could, do, you could do it. You got yeah. It. He believes in them. Right. And he aids and abets them. He sends them like police reports and stuff. Yeah, that was weird to me. Uh, yeah, so this guy who's trying to buy the island, he's out there when they get out there to look at the cabin, and he's like, get out of here! And they do, which I think was smart. Usually they just try to stay in their ground, and Biff's like, I can take him. <laughs> uh, 
fucking Biff. Um, <laughs> the boys make Christmas break plans, and I really like that they're like, we could, we'll pack up our bags, and then we'll be ready to leave first thing in the morning. And Chet's like, well, it's Christmas morning. Right. We might want to be home. And they're like, oh. And Joe and Frank are like, oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> With like, mom and our unmarried aunt. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. She's, we talked about that, that all the women are described as, like, slim and attractive, vivacious, and she is described as unmarried. Right. That's <laughs> all you have to know. They go see Mr. Jefferson. Okay. I have to ask you this. As an expert, you would know better than I. Are they black? Are the Jefferson family black? There's all <laughs> these, like, little hints in there that these, like, coded things that the, that I couldn't get out of my mind hmm. that Elroy Jefferson was a black guy. But they just don't say. I think it's a TV show that made you think that. Yeah? It's the Jefferson? <laughs> no, it's like there's all these things. Like, when he tells them that his son is missing, he's like, he's 15, but you would think he was much older. Hmm. And then they're like, he's like, all my medals are missing. And they're like, your athletic medals? There's like all these little these little hints in there, but the big one comes at the end. I'll I'll talk about that at the end when I finally was like, okay, okay, they they're black, um, <laughs> which it would be so it would have been so easy for them to just say that, and then you would have been like, oh, good, they like it's not a strict like t- rule of the town. Yeah, well, you know, I just read a uh, an article. The widow of Roald Dahl mm-hmm. said that he intended for Charlie yeah. to be black. And that the publisher shut it down and, you know, like... Which would have made it even more of, like, a cultural, like, iconic cultural thing. Yeah, if, we're talking uh, about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, by the way. To yeah. To say the whole thing, just so that whoever's listening... Right. They're like, Charlie, Sheen? <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was supposed to be black. Right. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> yeah, all right. Oh, yeah, when they go to see Mr. Jefferson, the angry guys, that's when they find out he wants to buy the house. Yeah. But they find out that he's got this collection of medals from Kings and... Greatness, medals for people who have served with greatness in war and peace. Mm. And I don't get, like, why it's okay to buy someone else's, like, family heirloom, a medal you got in war. He's like, I collect other people's awards. (laughs) Um, But apparently some of them are studded with gems, and they've been missing for two years. Yeah. And he hires them. It seems like he's like, I want you to find my medals. Also, my grandson is missing. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, so if, so if like while you're looking for the medals, my grandson turns up. Yeah, but he has no faith in his grandson. <laughs> he seems convinced that his grandson is just like completely incompetent. Yeah. Then again, he does turn up kind of like Let's see. Oh, Christmas morning. Yeah. I really like the Hardy's version of Christmas, where they like wake up in the morning and their mom is like, "All right, here's a huge breakfast. Uh, I'm gonna start working on the turkey dinner." <laughs> You're like, oh god, they eat so much. Yeah. In these books, every meal is that's marked. Them hearty. Yes, that's why they're hearty boys. <laughs> Did you have a lot of typos in yours? You know, I didn't notice. Any I, this has had more typos mm-hmm. than any. At one point, they're called the Hardsy Boys. Really? Yeah. I, see that. I was like, the Hardsies. Uh, you know, I read seventy-five percent of the novels, so. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. You're not the first. Yeah. To get that far into it, let's see. They go. To back to Mr. Jefferson's house. It's been ransacked. Uh huh. They this thing happens that always happens to me when they try to leave for a trip. Yeah. They can't. They show up at their boat and Chet and Biff have brought all their Christmas presents. <laughs> Biff has brought a set of weights. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I've got a set, new set of dumbbells, and they're like, and we're gonna take it on the boat to the cabin. So they have to take all yeah. that stuff Can back. Put that back. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> and then they get back, and their and their car's been completely ransacked. All the stuff's been taken out. Yeah. And then they go to their boathouse, and the That's sails been have been slashed, and their food um, has been stolen. Their food has been stolen. Which is really upsetting to the overweight character. He freaks checked. out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it takes them forever to leave, and the whole time I'm like, it was probably those dick kids. Yeah. Like the two guys from earlier. Yeah. They're the bad guys, right? Um, but then, yeah, and then as they're sailing out to the island, they see that they're, the names of the ice boats are pretty great. Mm-hmm. The boys is the seagull, which isn't, but then the bad guys, like the mean kids boat yeah. is called the hawk. <laughs> like, why, why isn't the hawk the hardy boys? Because it's the boat. badass bird for badass right. kids. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> they're badass kids. They're described as, call, or as high school dropouts at one point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they ramp. Uh, now, are we doing this in order? I mean, I'm just throwing out bad things uh, that they did. No, you can. You can. Uh, we can get as out of order as possible. I, was, I will try to get back to it eventually. But <laughs> I was just thinking about the hawk running the seagull. Oh yeah, yeah running right into it. And, yeah, and trashing it. Yeah, 
I mean, that's what a hawk does. Yes, it so does. It just takes it, them out. It wouldn't work the other way. The seagull rammed the hawk. No. Yeah. That sounds like a different thing happening. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, and then after that wreck happens, doesn't like one of the, like, Tad gets out and he's like, my ankle is hurt. You'll yeah. pay for this. <laughs> yes. My father will hear about this. It's definitely one of those. I really thought that those were regular characters in all the books. Nope. And it's good because their foil, their, like, not non-criminal foil was this character named Oscar Smuff, uh, who was, like, a bad detective. He's just, like, really bad at his job. Okay. But Oscar Smuff is just a depressing character. Huh. He, he does, he's no threat. You don't not like him. You just mostly feel bad for him. He's operating in a town with some of the world's greatest detectives. Huh. That's his yeah. whole living. So <laughs> He's just living in their shadow. Yeah, exactly. Constantly getting stuff wrong. Uh, yeah. I was thinking about uh, the only race that I saw mentioned specifically was Italian. Tony Preto. Yeah. And I was just wondering, like, I was thinking about the cultural ramifications in 1929. I don't know. Yeah. And now that I've known that they've been sanitized in the 50s. Like, Even that, yeah. like, in the original books, uh, and one of the ways you can tell original text is that they have two friends that are their minority friends. They okay. Have Tony Preto. Yeah. And they have Joel Cohen, who's Jewish. Okay. And the... And, Every single time Tony shows up, they're like, Tony, who was Italian. Yeah. Uh, and right. it's like, they it have was. to mention it right. every so. Yeah. And this one, they're like, of, of Italian descent. Yeah. But the Tony thing was funny to me, too. Because he's like, where are you guys going? And they're like, we're going to go spend Christmas break out on Cabin Island. Yeah. You want to you wanna come? And as the guy who's like, they're all standing there with their luggage. Yeah. And they're like, we could sail back and pick you up. And he's like, no. <laughs> I'll just fix your window. I'll just fix your window and go. Yeah. And he does. And he goes to help his dad with a construction job. And I, and I was like, fuck you guys. You didn't even invite me. You didn't right. call me. You didn't even <laughs> think, like, you know who would love to go? Tony. No. <laughs> I didn't realize he was a re- recurring character. It's always like that. Okay. Yeah, it's hard to tell. Tony can't get a break. The bullies seem like recurring characters. Right. Tony seemed like just a one-off. And I was like, okay. It's the other way around. Yeah. Who was Italian of Italian de- descent. That was <laughs> important to know. Yes. And his black eyes. <laughs> um yeah, well, we find out that the two uh, dickish boys are working for Hanley, who's the big, like, angry guy. But the boys scare them off, but Chet sees a ghost. A ghost. Yeah. Right. Um, and no one believes him, even though every time in the books before someone's seen a ghost, yeah. it's turned out to be something. Yeah. But they just, like, they don't care go at all. Go eat a sandwich. Yeah, go eat a sandwich, <laughs> Chet. Someone actually calls him Fatso in this book. Uh, yeah. Cool the lecture, Fatso. They have this whole chapter where it's just them setting up the cabin. Mm. It's like this lovely scene of them, like, making fires. And Chet makes a big stew for everybody. The artists can be domestic. They are. And then they do all the dishes as soon as they're done eating. And I'm like, (laughs) who are these teenage boys? They are an example. They are an example. Exactly. (laughs) And then they hear someone crying for help out in this big snowstorm. Yeah. And they go out, rescue some guy, bring him back. And it turns out their dad they, 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 yeah, they find dude. out that their dad sent this dude out yeah. in the snowstorm to give them a message. Yeah, that was a lot of hullabaloo for nothing, really. No, he sends a coded message yeah. that is like, the cat stalks the mice. Yeah. And then they broke it down and they were like, yeah, that's a code that our father always uses with us. Yeah. <laughs> See, like, we're the mice. <laughs> yeah. And the cat is the bad guy who's stalking us. And I'm like, yeah, I know. It's not a code, guys. This is, like, very obvious. And like, but they won't even talk about it about the w- around the guy who yeah. brought him the note because they, like, don't want him to know. He can't know the hardy code. He can't know the hardy code. <laughs> but then they immediately tell Chet and Biff what the code is <laughs> as soon as the guy shuts the door. Chet and Biff, who have been their lifelong friends. Yes. And have never heard the hardy code. No, don't know that they're the little <laughs> mice. They walk around this island like a thousand times in the book, looking yeah. for Johnny Jefferson, little Johnny Jefferson. Oh, they go back to they go back to shore. They keep going back from the island to the shore, so it gets yeah. confusing to me uh, when they're looking for clues. This happens a lot. There's like one location that they just keep returning to. Yeah. Um, but from the shore, they get a picture of Hanley, the bad guy, on the island, mm-hmm. and behind him is a foreigner, <laughs> and we know he's a foreigner because he's, he's a wearing turban. yeah a turban. <laughs> And a long white robe. Yeah, and uh, and he's been he's been very sneaky on the island because of the white robe that they like lose him and they. But even after they know, like, okay, that guy is not a ghost. Yeah, they keep talking about him as the ghost. Yeah, that was weird. That was his assassin name, the ghost. <laughs> so all their food has been stolen when they get yeah. back to the cabin. There's no food, and Chet's yes, yeah, Chet's horrified by this. I'll admit I'm hungry as a bear too, Joe said. Likewise, Biff put in. 
Well, fellows, Chet began sheepishly. I, er, forgot about this until now, but er, we can have a snack. The others stared at the rotund youth, the rotund youth, <laughs> who reddened as he explained. When I made sandwiches for lunch, I put some away in case of emergency. Where are they? asked Joe. We searched all over this place. Chet went into the bedroom he and Biff shared and returned with five thick sandwiches and a large plastic bag. Come on, where'd you hide them? Biff asked. In the bottom of my sleeping bag. <laughs> Chet was going to eat five sandwiches. Yes. As a midnight snack. Large. That Large. Was flavored by his feet. Thick sandwiches. <laughs> You weren't thinking of an emergency. That was going to be your midnight snack. And he's like, aren't you glad? And then they all eat the sandwiches. But just like... These taste like socks. How? (laughs) He was making sandwiches. And like at at the third sandwich, he wasn't like, that's enough sandwiches? I'll do... I'll just do a solid five. (laughs) That's what it is. He has uh, OCD. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Food-related OCD. (laughs) Yeah. It has to be multiples of five. It's not multiples of five. <laughs> what a, is one a multiple of five? Because that's how many sandwiches Chet should eat. Um, <laughs> let's see. Yeah, so they go, they get more supplies, um, and they come back and immediately find all their stolen stuff. They're yeah. like, oh, we didn't check snowdrifts. Right. And then they check snowdrifts, and then they also find a notebook with like a code in it, and they find a carving of their ice boat. Yeah, that they think, think is done by Johnny. Johnny yeah. Jefferson. What a weird. Yeah. That was weird. <laughs> There's so many weird things in this. Um, so they take the, they go back to get Mr. Jefferson to bring him out to the cabin. Mm-hmm. Not, I don't exactly remember why he uh, needs to go to the cabin. Yeah, why did he need to go? They had, it. I don't remember either. Yeah. I remember there was an accident getting him there. Yeah, because they get rammed by the hawk and the boat flips over. Yeah. With, like, an old man who the entire time has been like, I'm terrified of ice boats. Yeah. <laughs> His first time on an ice boat, he ends up capsized. Um, they show him the picture of the ghost. Maybe they left the book back in the, yeah. in the cabin. And he was oh, like, that's oh, right. Come see it. Come see the... Yeah. Um, his medals that are stolen disappeared at the exact same time as his house... Man, yeah, uh, Sparewell or whatever his name was, and so this is a notebook that they think belongs to that that guy. Who I don't understand that either. He like took the medals and disappeared at the same time. And they're like, but we're sure he's not involved. Yeah, even the guy in town. Yeah, yeah he's like, I don't know. It doesn't I don't, seem like. I don't him. think it was him. Yeah, I don't understand it. Um, they decide to take take watch in case an intruder uh, comes, mm-hmm. and uh, Chet falls asleep during his watch. Yes. And Intruder comes in. Yeah. Um, the ghost. The ghost, yeah. So they chase him out. And then Joe climbs in the chimney and finds a tape measure. Hmm. There's like... That's about when I when I dropped out of the book. All right. <laughs> but I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat to find out how it ended. <laughs> okay. Well, you're going you're gonna to love it. I'm going to read... Let's see. 120. Did you read anything about the uh, when they finally catch the ghost? No. All right, well, that chapter is called The Shah's Prize. Wow. This guy works for the Shah. We are not told which Shah. Hmm. But he works for the Shah, and apparently one of the medals in the collection um, belongs to the Shah, and he, like, they handily told him that he could get his hands on it, even though he didn't know where it was. And this guy came out to, like, meet Hanley and get the medal, but Hanley did the thing. He was like, I, well, I don't have it now, but I can get it. Huh. Um, I know a guy. I know a guy. And then this guy just like hung out on the island for a couple days in the winter, yeah. and, like sneaking around in his robes. He had a secret cave. He had. Oh yeah, that's right. His name <laughs> is Yusef Ben Karim. I represent the ruler of my country, our great Shah Ali. I can't even imagine what the original version. Of oh, I know. That would be like. There's. I mean, he's swarthy, definitely. <laughs> um, but he's presented as pretty like. You know, he doesn't try to kill them in their sleep or anything. Which is what you would expect yeah. for how people are portrayed in these books. And from a g- 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 ghost. Yes. G- 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 oh, they <laughs> found out that the, the ghost sounds that we're hearing in the house oh, yeah. is the classic, like, wind over the bottle top. Yeah. Because Jefferson used a, a bottle to plug a hole in his roof. Yeah. As you do. As you do. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if they were the first to do that. 1929. That sounds like a little rascal's gag. That yeah, it really Charlie does. Chaplin. Yeah. yeah. Right. Kinda. And then you show the, the wind over it. I don't know how you would show that in silent film. 
Oh, yeah, so he goes through this whole bit about how, like, now he's on their side because he realized that Hanley's a bad guy. Mm. So Joe, at this point, Joe is... Because the whole meeting with Yusuf Ben Kareem or whatever his name was happens at Mr. Jefferson's house. Okay. They go back there, I guess. And Joe is out on Cabin Island keeping watch. And he spies Hanley come up to the house. And he's, like, looking through the window and he hears Hanley yell... I told you not to snoop around anymore. So he thinks he's caught. But it turns out that Ike and uh, Tad yeah. are looking in the window and spying on this guy who's hired them because they're just like super curious. And he mm. grabs him and he throws him in the woodshed. And this is like, it's clearly like cold enough that people are worried about frostbite at this point. Yeah. And he just locks him in there and leaves. Well, they are high school dropouts. So yeah, exactly. Who cares? What value? Yeah. yeah. And uh-huh. uh, he's like, oh, I have a place that'll keep you warm. And he throws him in the in the woodshed and locks them in and joe's like good at least i know where they are and then books it and then leaves. he's like i'm gonna go investigate some clues uh which made me kind of happy that i'm like good for you joe like they can sit in there for a while they they'll be okay it. they had it coming yeah they tried to i mean they rammed it with their boat yeah for wrecking the soil dove or whatever it is. <laughs> the soil dove <laughs> what was their ice boat called the seagull oh there we go yeah so uh so let's see the uh, oh and then so Joe is like I'm gonna leave him in there and he goes looking for he's got this idea that there's hot springs on the island huh. he's become convinced he won't tell anybody why he thinks that huh. everyone's like what was all the hot spring stuff you were asking about and he's like it's a hunch I'm working on and they're like clue us in and he's like no it's a secret coded what message if, my dad sent me yeah, yeah right <laughs> the main thing is that the Hardy Boys are always right yeah. like whatever idea they get it's usually right huh. so. I feel like the way that you get you do that is you just never say your ideas until you're sure that they're right. You you ask questions about it, but you don't tell them there are hot springs here. Or Johnny Jefferson has a cave by a hot spring. But anyway, as he finds this like warm area where the snow is starting to melt, and he's like yeah. this cave, he gets knocked out um, and wakes up tied up in the snow, huh. worried that he's going to get frostbite. Um, but still not worried about the bullies. No, no, he's now he's got his own worries. <laughs> um, way more. Urgent. Missing, right? yeah. And like, and we care about Joe. Well, we kind of care about Joe. <laughs> yeah, he finished um, high school, or he's still in high school. One of the two. I can't tell how old they are. I can't either, partly because they're like, we stopped these car thieves in summer break, and yeah. now it's immediately Christmas break. And I'm like, well, wait, but Frank was a senior. <laughs> so, like, is Frank a double se- Is he out of school now? Right. But well, he's been spending all his time solving mysteries and yeah, like, exactly. his studies. First of all... Frank and Chet and Biff get back and they think Joe's trapped in the wood closet because somebody's banging on it and screaming. And they open it up and it's, they're like the guys they hate. And they're like, oh, where's Joe? And then they find Joe and Joe's like bluish gray in the snow. (laughs) But it takes about 30 minutes and a cup of hot cocoa and Joe's like on his feet ready to go. Um, (laughs) Which I'm always impressed by how sturdy these boys are. And, oh, they crack the code. And the code basically is like, Oh, the code is where the metals are hidden in the cabin. The metals are in the cabin. Oh. The whole time. Let's see here. Yeah, so there's so they're in the house. They have cracked the code, and there's a huge like snowstorm outside. Yeah. And they hear someone crying for help outside again. It's pretty much the same thing. I think they're hiking around maybe and they and they hear somebody screaming for help. Guess who is guess who it is? Who's calling for help? Yeah. Who that they now have to go rescue. Oh. Uh, is it Chet? No, it's <laughs> it's the guy Hanley. Oh, really? The, like the bad guy of the whole thing. He crashed his boat. <laughs> and as he's like, I'm going to take your boat, the the hawk, to Tad and Ike. They're like, you don't know how to drive the boat. That's why you hired us. That's pretty funny. And then so That's he crashes true. it like right away. Yeah. Um, and so they have to like carry him back to the house to take care of him. And he's like cursing them out the whole way. Yeah. Telling him to leave him alone. Oh, they they see another ghost. <laughs> and, they, and Chet's like... I saw another ghost. And they're like, no, you didn't, Chet. What? <laughs> After the first time. After yeah, the first right. time, there was a real dude. Yeah. So, uh, so they go out and they like chase this ghost and they find him. Guess who the ghost is? That is, oh, I don't know, man. I'm about to guess this. Johnny Jefferson. Oh. Little Johnny Jefferson, who's wearing white robes and a turban huh. to hide, to like disguise himself. And the, the thing that to me, they when they see him, Face on. They see his face and they go, Yusuf? <laughs> and then he takes off the turban. They're like, you're not Yusuf. I'm like, he's black. He is at least dark skinned enough that they thought that he was this guy, this like guy, this Middle Eastern dude with the turban. Huh. And uh, 
And turbans are well known to disguise your face. To disguise your face, exactly. <laughs> That's just science. Uh, yeah, so it turns out that turns out that he Hanley told Johnny that he would train him to be a, a detective. Uh, He's like, I'm going to train you to be a detective, and I'll, and we'll find your grandpa's medals together. And uh, quickly, that all turned out to be, you know, wrong. Wait, so where was Johnny hiding all this time? He was, was hiding his house. First, he was hiding in the cabin, apparently. Yeah. Then he was hiding in his little cave area. Yeah. And then he was hiding in, like, another little cave area. He okay. grew up on this island. I see. Um, and there, the his grandpa, Mr. Jefferson, knows that he's on the island because he's like, this ice boat, Johnny always carved ice boats. It's what he did as a boy. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. It's a very weird thing to do as a boy. Uh, but yeah, but at the end, they're just about to try to... Oh, that's right. They they get Mr. Jefferson. They bring him back to the house and they climb up in the chimney because of the code. Yeah. And they pull out one of the, the bricks and behind it, the bag of metals. <laughs> uh, jeweled, glittering. This is the craziest... I'm going to just read this. It turns out that the houseman, Spearman or whatever his name was, yeah. did steal the metals. Oh. Definitely. He tried to sell them and nobody would buy them because they are like, this is Mr. Jefferson's metal uh. collection. And so he couldn't, he couldn't move them and he felt really bad about it. So on his deathbed, he requested that his nephew return the collection to Mr. Jefferson. His nephew is apparently this guy, Hanley, who's been like oh, okay. going around all the time. Why didn't he do it himself earlier? Chet asked Hanley. Because he was chicken. That's why. Uncle John was afraid old man Jefferson would try to bring him to justice. He wanted the medals to be in an absolutely secret place. So he thought of this cabin, which is owned by Mr. Jefferson. <laughs> On one of Jefferson's trips, my uncle spent a weekend hiding the collection out here in the chimney lining. But at the time, he didn't tell me where, Hanley complained. The next I heard about the collection was when he died, and I came into possession of the notebook with a clue out to this island and the secret code. What? What? So he snuck on the island to return the metals that he stole. Right. But he hid them in the chimney. But he, he cemented them into the chimney. <laughs> Instead of... He could have left them on the coffee table. Yeah. And just... It would have been or over. Or just not return them. Or not return if them. you're going to hide them in the chimney. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to hide them forever. Huh. Uh, yeah. That is not how I thought it was going to end. I thought that Chet was going to end up being Kaiser Soze. Oh. <laughs> That would have been a really... It would have been a great twist. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and so they're about to... They're, uh, as what happens at the end of almost all these books, they're about to try to take uh, Hanley back to the shore, and mm -hmm. the doors get kicked in, and two men step in and yell, Hold it! You're under arrest! All of you! It's the cops. Tad and Ike reported... Because they made Tad and Ike walk home across <laughs> the ice. I thought they were still trapped in the... No, they let them out of the woodshed, yeah. and then they're like, will you guys give us a ride home? And they're like, no, you can <laughs> walk home. The entire book, no one fell through the ice. And there were so many scenes of them walking across the frozen bay yeah. to the island. I was like, that seems guaranteed that that's going to be one of the rescues that has to happen. Yeah, right. But no, it's the cops. The cops recognize the Hardys and do not open fire, uh, which is great. Most of the time, I think, like... The officers would have just, like, opened fire. Well, at one point, they were looking for, like, a murderer. Yeah. And the boys walked up the beach dressed as homeless people. And this cop saw them and was like, get down. They're like, no, no, it's us. And I was like, they would have just been, they would have been dropped. No cop is going to take that risk. <laughs> you know what I was saying earlier? That uh, the messenger was, like, a lot of like, much ado about nothing kind of thing. It, it was just this weird thing where, like, somebody is yelling help. They go through all of this stuff to find them. Mm -hmm. Pages and pages trying to find them in the blinding snow. They find them. They all come together. They lift the tree branch because it's trapped underneath it. They drag them back to their cabin. They nurse them back the whole night to health. Mm -hmm. And they take watch. Just watching, take shifts watching over him. And then when he finally recovers, he's like, I'm okay. Got a message from your father. Okay, see you later. <laughs> yeah, I'll walk home. Right. No one will go to the hospital. Yeah. They're like... Oh no! You had shock. You probably have like some nerve damage and muscle damage. You were out. You were out in the snow for a long time. He's like, you know what? Speedboat crash. Yeah. Boat crash. Yeah. Boat crash. Uh. No. The hard. Yeah. Hardy people in Bayport. Let's see. Oh, they're like we found the medals and we found Johnny and he's like, all right, I'm gonna go tell. They're like, I'm gonna go tell Mr. Jefferson that all this is resolved. And they're like, well, 
tell them that you arrested Hanley, but don't tell them any of the other stuff because we want it to be a surprise. And the cops are like, sure thing. <laughs> oh, they have a rip. Yeah, cops. exactly. Yeah. I also like, this happens a lot too, but they get a fingerprint at one point from the ransacked house huh. and uh, Fenton is able to call them within a day to be like, we found out whose fingerprints those were. <laughs> They're like, wow, it is not that fast now. Um, yeah. I'm taking a step backwards. I blame Trump. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Time traveling Trump. <laughs> oh, what a terrifying concept. Uh, think of the, yeah, the ripples that guy would cause. Oh, man. Um, yeah, they... T3. T3, exactly. Time traveling Trump. Time traveling Trump. <laughs> yeah, good book series. <laughs> um, they The boys really want Ike and Tad to be charged as accomplices, but... Their dad says that he can't because they didn't even know what Hanley was up to. But I'm like, but you took money from a guy you knew was a criminal and to to do work for him. And Think. ram them and destroy their boat. Yeah, it's assault. With the old man in the boat. Right. Well, they say, like, we didn't know the old man was in the boat. <laughs> like, I don't think that would have mattered. Um, but they take Johnny home. They take the medals home. Johnny's like, can I get a ride on your ice boat? And they're like, sure thing. And then their grandpa is like... You can do that after you take me for a ride on your ice boat, Johnny. You've proved that you can handle yourself. <laughs> I'm like, what? He ran away, didn't solve the mystery, uh, like took up with the wrong kind of people, then lived in the woods. Disguised like, himself. Disguised himself in a turban. Left his carvings around randomly. Yeah, like that's taking care of yourself. <laughs> and he says that since my ride in the seagull, I've been looking forward to another spin on the ice. The one ride where he had an accident. Where he had an accident and got thrown from the boat. Yeah. But, like, that was, was probably... unconscious. Yeah. <laughs> he was yeah. knocked unconscious. Yeah. It's like, I remember it being really fun. <laughs> and then it goes dark. And then we were at the cabin. <laughs> right. Um, which I assume it's... Is it like that every time? Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> that's... Yeah. Hopefully not. But then he gives the... Um, he gives each of the boys one of the priceless medals from his collection oh, really? as a souvenir, hmm. which I'm like, that's some families. Is that going to be another mystery later where some like guy shows up and he's like, my grandfather fought in the Spanish American war right. and that's his medal. And they'll be like, Oh, they'll probably just give it back. They probably just trust anybody. Well, they're rich hardies. Right. The money thing was interesting. The only one of the only times they've ever not had money was in this book where they're like, uh, we all have snowshoes. And they're like, our snowshoes got busted. And we don't have enough yeah. money to replace them. Yeah, I remember that. You don't have enough money. Since when have you guys had... But that was just a setup for them to get snowshoes for Christmas. Yeah. Parents know what they need. So, that's uh... The of the story. Yeah. And that's and that's how it ends. The boys get a reward. John Jefferson gets his ice boat. Um, Starts with a reward. Ends, ends with a reward. reward. That yes. is a good Christmas break. <laughs> right. So what did you think? First impressions. Uh, Last impressions. <laughs> it felt like a sign reading in second grade. Right. That I didn't particularly enjoy. Uh, which is why I didn't finish it. But <laughs> uh, culturally, it was interesting. Uh, it's really fascinating to me that, to hear that they were rewritten. Like, that yeah. was a really interesting tidbit. Because, you know, like for as antiquated as they seem now, I just can't imagine trying to read the original <laughs> stories. Yeah. There's people with names like Baldy Turk. In wow. the original ones that get completely cut out. Huh. Yeah, I I find it hard to imagine that a lot of times that these could be worse. But <laughs> I, I've read a couple of the original ones, and they're, they are worse. Um, hmm. They're also a hundred pages longer. Oh, really? And did you think this book needed another hundred pages? <laughs> I don't think so, no. from, your, uh, <laughs> from your reading of it. Yeah. Uh, how well, many of them are there? How many are Okay, so place? of the ones that were rewritten, I think yeah. there were 38. Okay. All told, I think there are 70-some. Wow. There's a list in the back. These are Nancy Drew ones. There's a list in the front. <laughs> oh, they're not numbered. Are they in the public domain now? Things pass into public domain and get public. Cartoons that have uh, fallen into the public domain. Mm -hmm. released, like, like you'll see it at Walmart. There's gas station. 250 right. classic cartoons. Right. right. It'll be like Bugs Bunny and stuff. That, you know, it'll just be episodes that they have failed to or just have expired. Mm -hmm. Copyright. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would believe that at least, you know, the ones that were written before 1930 yeah. should be sitting in the public domain. So I was thinking, I mean, because if you wanted to, uh, well, if you wanted to print a Shakespeare story, right? Mm -hmm. Like, the publisher can do it. Yeah. It's in the public domain. 
That's why on, you know, on the Kindle, that's why I always download public domain books. But oftentimes yeah. they're like the worst, tra- you know, like translation of it onto oh, yeah. a Kindle. Because they're like, look, I did it for free, okay? Right. I don't have to try. Well, here's some uh, geek shit regarding yeah. the public domain. So there's this book called Gladiator. Mm-hmm. It was written in 1930. Wiley, right? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Philip Wiley, yeah. Uh, and so uh, every people feel like that's where they got the idea for Superman. Because Superman was created in 1938. But it's a... Uh, and a lot of Spider-Man ideas. Basically, it's a character whose father uh, figured out some kind of scientific formula to endow him with the proportional strength of an insect. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he can like he's like running through the woods, like leaping yeah. these giant leaps. He's and racing stuff. trains. Yep. He's jumping over buildings, uh, and he even has the scene where he is a prize fighter trying to make money the way the Spider-Man was. Yeah. When he first, yeah. And that's that's in the public domain, so people can print that and stuff like that. Uh, and then, oh, and then he was from Colorado, so there's a that's right, right. So there's a scene where uh, he's fighting war in France, and everybody's like, "How are you so strong?" And he's like, "Everybody from Colorado is so strong." He, nice, <laughs> like, really? yeah. H- H- Hugo Danner. Is that yeah. the character's yeah, name? Yeah, that's the character's name. I haven't yeah. read that book in a long time, but it really made an impact. Uh, there's a scene in it where they do the same. He like does the same procedure that he's going to do his son to the cat. Mm. and like the cat is so strong that they're like hiding in a room in the house and it's like bat scratching <laughs> yeah. at the door like getting through it uh yeah and they have to kill it with like a shotgun or something yeah. but i really uh, did enjoy that book yeah like, anybody can print it marvel uh created they did like a series like a limited series mm-hmm. in the 90s or early aughts uh no so those are not those are copyright right but like so whatever you do with a public domain character if you create a new thing then those parts of it are copyright copyrighted well, that's cool well before you go i wanted to talk a little bit about burning metronome okay so i read the first issue yeah they have available online i recommend everybody do that because it's fantastic Thanks. um so artist and your inker and letterer uh are so uh the pencil and inker is uh dion harris okay and then uh the colorist and letterer is matt strike by so he's my partner, and then we hired Dion for uh, the first story arc. Okay. And um, Matt, man, that dude is incredible. Like, not only with his colors, he's, he also has written and drawn some backup features in Hellboy and BPRD. Oh, cool. Yeah, like, they they let him write from the perspective of a fan. So he'll do, like, four-page backups. Nice. So he wrote one where he got to give uh, baby Hellboy a piggyback ride. Stuff <laughs> like that. Yeah. Nice. So those are pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, but the comic, The Burning Metronome, is basically Twilight Zone meets Usual Suspects. So kind of a supernatural murder mystery with uh, social commentary. Yeah, I uh, obviously won't probably talk too much about it, but like, I love the the this like hinted at mythology in that first issue. Hmm. That like, there feels like it's just the skimming of the surface of something that's like incredibly complicated. <laughs> uh, that just like. Yeah, like, I can tell that I'm, like, there's an entire, like, reality below this. Um, and all this the stuff with the co- the house, like, the cop in the yeah. house. Anyway, everybody should read it. It's, it's great. great. It's on Tumblr. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, can they contribute to the project at all? Uh, well, they, Did we, your Kickstarter we, get yeah, so funded we, and everything? Yeah, so we did a Kickstarter in October, so it hasn't even been a year yet. Uh, we were trying to raise 8400 mm-hmm. We raised 14000 All right. Which surprised me. Yes. And so uh, we released the first issue, which you read, actually, Time Warp Comics in okay. Boulder. They, uh, they paid for the printing of the first one, which is really nice. Enough. Yeah. And then uh, with the Kickstarter, we put out a 166-page hardcover. So uh, that premiered in the end of July. We printed it at Denver Comic Con. Right. And uh, it's been going pretty good. We sold a lot there. Uh, the press has been pretty kind. And then I'm just finding random stuff like that site, Goodreads. Yeah. People have put reviews up. Oh, that's great. And they're like at least four out of five stars. And they're not people I know. That's (laughs) what, that's, those are the only ones that matter, right? Right. I always say my family, they'll come to a play I wrote and they'll be like, it was great. And I'm like, well, you, right. that doesn't mean anything. One of my best experiences though, was the opposite of that. I was at a play I wrote and the people behind me hated it. Ah. And they spent the whole play just ripping it to pieces. Huh. And for some reason, that was so much like, that was so satisfying for me. Yeah. Because I was like, these people are not watching this as something that they uh, 
have to yeah. and find things to like about it. They're just watching it as a thing and they don't like it, uh, you know, but everybody else did. So, you know, like that's, <laughs> that's good. I mean, yeah. I, I would say, you know, that might be hard for me. I think uh, the honesty of it mm-hmm. is good. And I would like to think that I would really be like, yeah, I'll just take the, the, the good parts of it and be able to pull out. But nah, man, well, man, part man. of their like complaints were things like I couldn't get the actual symphony. So oh, I used oh. like recorded <laughs> so symphonic just music. Just unrealistic stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so that was part of what was so entertaining. Is I was like, well, it's nice of them to think that like this studio, <laughs> that the studio theater at the Aurora Fox could hold the symphony. Um, and that the they would angel be angel characters can't even fly. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of, I didn't get it. What kind um, of backyard operation is this? All right. Well, R. Alan Brooks, it has been wonderful having you on the show. Everybody, listen to Motherfucker in a Cape. Read The Burning Metronome. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you for having me. It was fun. I really appreciate it. Each episode, we have one of our favorite local bartenders mix us up a custom cocktail to sip while we read. Today's cocktail was created by Ben Hoops at the Squire Lounge. Pictures and the drink recipe are up on the website. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. I am here at the Squire Lounge with Ben Hoops. Uh, ben, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Glad to be here. So, Ben, tell us a little bit about The Squire. Uh, so, The Squire has been a dive bar in the Colfax for about 75 years now. My parents used to come here to buy drugs in the 70s. I've seen a, Ch- a Chinese restaurant, a few other restaurants. The scariest piss smelling venue for comedy for a long time. Remodeled in 2013. Cleaned up a little bit. Still has the edginess to a degree. Lots of live music now. Still doing the comedy here and there. Bit of Neverman's Bar. I'm very supportive of the LGBTQ community. Do lots of charity work. Try to be a nice, good neighborhood dive. Yeah, you gotta love, and like you walk in and you have these beautiful tin ceilings. Yeah, so that was original. They did the remodel. In... Oh, I, I didn't think that you guys installed those in no, a no. couple of years ago. But it had the drop ceiling back in, like, you know, up until 2013. They pulled it out and found those beautiful tins up there and, like, just repainted them, it's and here amazing. we are. amazing. Yeah, no, I love I love the juxtaposition of the divingness of the bar mm-hmm. and the circle bar that you have, like the full round yep. bar. I really love that. It's got these great classic uh, touches to it. And the beautiful, uh, is that original art? Yeah, so uh, that mural was originally part of a dance studio that was part of this building long ago. And just as they discovered the tins under the drop ceiling, they discovered the mural underneath a piece, like essentially some pieces of wood as they did the remodel. Great. The Hardy Boys is all about finding hidden treasures. Absolutely. That, that is some of the best actual hidden treasure you can find. 100%. You, usually if you tear down a wall, you just find nightmare. Generally, you know? yes. Yeah, so this that's a wonderful situation. Asbestos and mesothelioma and spiders and bad times. All the kind of things that they advertise legal services on daytime TV for. Ab- exactly. Yeah, yeah, okay. So... What's your story? How'd you get into bartending? Uh, so I've been doing the service industry since I was 10 years old. From Colorado, worked in a Mexican restaurant when I was 10 years old in Golden. And then uh, since then, you know, I had aspirations of being a chef and then realized I excel at the front of house more so than the back of house. And also working a line for 18 hours in a row for like $10 an hour. Just, nah. So Jack and I are from South Dakota. Okay. Um, when you are from South Dakota, especially in the Black Hills, yeah, you get put on the cooking line at a tourist trap Absolutely. at about 14. That's, that's I cut my teeth at the Little Bear up in Evergreen, which right. is a tourist trap in the mountains. Yeah, where you, we feel your pain. Uh, yeah. yeah, those long, long hours mm-hmm. of slinging food. Well, I was going to talk to you a little bit about the Hardy Boys. Now, we were talking before the recording started, and it sounds like you have a, some connection to these. I do, absolutely. I mean, I my dad's side of the family is very... Americana, old like East Coast family, and my dad was given the entire Hardy Boys collection as a child. So we had it in our house always, never really read much of it. Is he always kind of pushed off his campy whatever? But it's super fun. I read a few as a kid. Yeah, we they're were... they're crazy, and even people who I've talked to have been like, I read dozens of those, mm-hmm. don't remember any. Of them. <laughs> it's they they're, they're they're fun, but somehow forgettable. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you're yeah, like earlier, right. weren't they hmm, in a plane? There might have been a cave, perhaps a mill. Who <laughs> yes. knows? A we windmill? A sugar mill? Mm-hmm. We, I think we've been to all of those places, <laughs> so that's great. Well, you have made us a fantastic cocktail. Oh, thank you. I'll do my what, best. Uh, talk to us a little bit about it. So that is a bit of the Rembe's Mezcal, uh, Porto Lee's Tequila, the Blanco, um, Amaro de Angostura, Shinar 70, and some strawberry syrup stirred with a flamed orange garnish. Um, I'm a big fan of simple cocktails that are mostly alcohol-based. Yes. Things that should taste really strong and really intense, but to have a subtlety to them, a complexity that kind of smooths everything out. That's always been my go-to. And, you know, strong drinks are, they get you, they get the job done quicker and in a more fun way, usually. All right, well, I'm going to take a sip of this and pretend like I haven't already taken several. Yeah. Do what you got to do. It's fabulous. Thank you. 
it's it's boozy, but it has that. I don't know if it's just the expressed orange peel or what, but there's something in it that's giving it some lightness and sweetness. I think maybe there is strawberry syrup and the orange peel as well, because when I tried it out the first time without the orange peel, it was like, what does this need? And then did the orange peel, and there it was. So honestly, when you said strawberry syrup, I was like, this is going to taste like a strawberry mm -hmm. uh, or like a fake strawberry, and it doesn't. It's a perfect balance. Thank you. I love how that mezcal tastes. All right, mezcal is one of my favorite of the spirits. The, the way of mez mezcal is uh, so. All tequilas are mezcals, but not yes. all mezcals are tequilas. Right. So it's pretty like, much uh, any any Mexican produced agave spirit is going to be a mezcal. And but you know uh, we're very most familiar with tequila, which is from right. the Jalisco region, the blue Weber agave. It can only be that one thing. There's all kinds of rules. Mezcal can be any agave. Very few rules. You kind of it's a much more. Uh, oh, see, that's that's really interesting. I always thought that it was sort of like how uh, all all cognac is brandy, but mm -hmm. not all brandy is cognac. But it's kind of the opposite. Yeah, exactly. But and so it's, it's pretty cool because most of the stuff, like, you know, lots of it has been like produced in small villages by single families, and there's a lot of people like discovering. Like my good friend Brian Rossi, owner of Adelita's Blinke, he's been doing great work going down, working with those people, bringing a bunch of stuff up, helping education and whatnot. And it's yeah, it's, it's cool. We're getting a lot better like understanding and view of how Mexican spirits actually work. Well, I believe in an upcoming book, the Hardy Boys are going to Mexico. Nice. So when we do that, I am probably going to get that contact information from Definitely, you yeah. and, uh, and highlight that. What do you love most about bartending? Um, essentially, I get to host a party every night. Yeah. I'm here to make people have a good time, enjoy themselves, kind of get a, a break away from the day-to-day -day grind. And especially, you know, it's a place like this one where you get every type of person. You get Congress Park families, you get day laborers, you get musicians, comedians, artists, poets, etc. So... It's nice to see the group, different groups of people and to make them all happy with alcohol. Yeah, you're hosting like the modern version of like, well, what like a cocktail party exactly, in the 20s, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, uh, where you're like, oh, we have to invite writers and actors. Yes. and uh, must be all the most important yes. people from all around. People from Capitol Hill and the guy from the corner. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the bum who just gets scraped enough money together to get a beer and also, you know, some, you know, we'll have Nathaniel Rateliff or say any of the, like the guys from... Those who can't cut their teeth here in the comedy scene. Yeah, so it's, great. it's a nice little, uh, little caveat to that. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Enjoy. The Hardy Boys Drink Book Podcast is a part of their network. It is produced by Jack and Charles Wetset. Music is provided by Danny Overby with Round Two Productions. Photos and graphic design are provided by Kristen Holstrom. Special thanks to R. Allen Brooks for being our guest, Ben Hoops for making our drink, and Bunport Theater for allowing us to use their space to record. If you want to support the show, you can find us on Patreon. And if you like the show, please leave us a review on iTunes. It's the best way to reach new listeners. If you have any comments or drunken fan theories, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter and at thehardyboysdrinkbook.com. Don't forget to tune in next episode. I'll be joined by playwright Josh Hartwell for Episode 9 of the Hardy Boys Drink Book Podcast, The Great Airport Mysteries.